In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of hierarchical models and dive into a, an important uh, common but uh, special case of hierarchical models called random effect models. So on the left here, I've written down uh, the, the model we ended our last lecture with, which is a simple hierarchical means model. We have uh, k data sets, y through yk, uh, each of which has a mean mu k. Uh, that mean mu k is distributed with some overall uh, across data set mean and across data set variability tau. And we have a prior on the within data set variability, a, a prior on the across data set variability, and a prior on that global mean. The idea of a random effects model is we can rewrite this process model, uh, yk uh, as a mean mu k, as yk follows some global mean mu g plus some alpha k, which is the difference between uh, that data set's mean and the global mean. So you could see that you could rewrite this mu k as mu k equals mu g plus alpha k. So alpha k is just uh, you know, the difference between mu g and mu k. So it's mathematically equivalent to the same model. We've just reorganized our process model a little bit to kind of express the, the, the hierarchical effect in terms of how uh, this particular parameter differs from the global parameter. One important uh, effect of that is that because all of the uh, alpha k's are expressed as deviations from the, the global mean mu g, uh, those alpha k's now are, are um, model that has a mean of zero. So by definition, uh, the mean of these alphas, which are what, what are referred to as the random effects, so the mean of these random effects, the alphas, uh, has to be zero because they're expressing deviations from the global parameter set mu g. And then this tau, again, is our across data set variability. And then as before, we have the within data set variability sigma, the global mean, and tau, which is the across data set variability. So it's all the priors are equivalent. We've just rewritten our process model slightly so that we are expressing it in terms of deviations or anomalies away from that global mean. So some key points about random effects models. One is that the random effects always have a mean of zero. Uh, the random effect variance uh, is used to attribute some portion of variability to a specific source. Uh, and you know, just you know, in keeping with how we're using hierarchical models more generally, we can use them to account for this lack of independence among these different data sets. Uh, one real advantage of rewriting a hierarchical model in this random effects framework is it makes it easier uh, to account for multiple sources of variability. So in, in the traditional hierarchical framework, if I had two sources of variability, I'd have to think about is, is one nested within the other or vice versa. Uh, but in a random effects framework, I could write you know, this alpha k uh, for say how the sites are different. And then I might have some alpha t, which might describe how the years are different. And then I might have you know, y k comma t as the subscripts. I could have different data sets from different sites and different years. To look at this in a graphical model, we have our alpha k's for each individual data set, our global mean and uh, within data set variability, which has priors on it. So this is just a simple global mean model. And then we have uh, the parameter model for the alphas is just the variability because again, the mean is zero. And then there has to be a, a hyperparameter on that. So what sort of things can be random effects? This is actually really important. Uh, so traditionally, random effects are used to apply to aspects of a study that would not be the same if the study was replicated. So if, I, if you did the study again, you might tag different individuals, or you would do the study in different years, or the exact locations of your plots or blocks would be different if you replicated the study, if someone else replicated the study in a different location, they would definitely be using different 
plots or blocks or watersheds or, or lakes or whatever. It's, it's kind of random effects are, are very much, you know, your, measure, your different scales of measurement uh, units within uh, a given study. And we're often using these random effects to account for the lack of independence uh, within those scales, as well as to partition out those variabilities. And, and in essence, uh, trying to account for the unexplained variability uh, in that scale that's not explained by our, our process models. Uh, by contrast, things like uh, experimental treatments or covariates of interests are usually treated as what we call as fixed effects. If you repeated the experiment again, you would have the same experimental manipulations or you'd have the same covariates in an observational study. They are kind of kind of the key parts of our, our process model that are still stay part of the process model. It's also worth noting that you do need some degree of replication uh, within any measurement unit that you're using a random effect for. Otherwise, the random effect is not identifiably different from just the residual noise term. So you can't put a random effect on every individual measurement you make because that's essentially the same as just the residual noise. So why bother uh, doing this partitioning? Uh, if the overall variability is the same, what good comes from partitioning it out? This figure is meant to illustrate uh, that partitioning out variability, even if we can't explain why we see the variability we do, can actually have pretty large impacts on our ability to make predictions. So in these two panels are uh, 10 time series uh, each of, of 10 years each. So these might be 10 sites that were measured each for 10 years. And these uh, data sets have been engineered so that the, the overall variance in the data sets is actually identical. So there's, if you just looked at, if you just have hit a model that just had an overall residual, uh, the residual error you know, on an, an overall mean would be identical for each of these two data sets. Uh, but th let's think about how we would make a prediction in these data sets. So in the first data set, if I am looking at this, you know, say the fourth uh, site, and I'm making a prediction for that same site uh, into a new year, I'm actually going to be quite confident because in this first data set, there's a large amount of site to site variability, but very little year to year variability. And so if I'm predicting the same site for a new year, I'm going to be pretty confident. By contrast, if I'm in the 10th year and wanted to make a prediction for an 11th site, uh, there's a lot of site to site variability. So I'd have much less confidence making a prediction to a new site uh, than I would have to making a new year. And if I make a prediction uh, for a new site and a new year, then I essentially am not able to leverage the structure of the data. Uh, I just have this overall variability. Uh, by contrast, in the lower time series, where most of the variability is year to year, if I'm in you know, the fourth site and make a prediction to a new year, uh, I don't have much confidence. But if I'm in the 10th year and make a prediction to a new site, say site 11, uh, I would actually be able to make a very confident prediction to that new site. And then again, a uh, new site, a new year, these are now identical. So you know, we could see that these predictions to a new site or a new year could be very different uh, depending on uh, how we partition that variability, even if we don't know why the years are different or why the sites are different. Uh, yeah. And, and this uh, shows what happens if we took, take some of those random uh, individual and temporal effects or rights and put them into a process-based model. And here we're seeing that uh, in the left-hand side is the predictions of adult tree densities uh, where we do not put random effects in the model and the green species beats the red species consistently. Uh, by contrast, if we put the random effects in, we not only change uh, which species is dominant, but we change uh, the coexistence so the species are able to coexist. And this is without a change in the means of any of the parameters. It's just a change in how the variability is handled within these models. 